1944. For two long years, Europe has waited for liberation. Hitler still occupies the entire continent, but everywhere he's on the defensive. The German armies are retreating in Russia. The Allies have invaded Italy and are marching on Rome. They're certain to land in the West this year. Hitler has built his Atlantic Wall, which extends from Norway to the Pyrenees, passing through Pau de Calais and the beaches of Normandy. Hitler has ordered that it be made an impregnable fortress. Field Marshal Rommel, the Desert Fox, is now Commander-in-Chief of Army Group B, an Inspector General of the coasts of Holland, Belgium and France, a 900-mile front. For Rommel, the battle will be fought here on the beaches. He will throw the British and American forces straight back into the sea. This will be the longest day, he warns. Rommel is not happy from the moment he sets foot on the shore. Why are these beaches so utterly devoid of obstructions? Wooden stakes and concrete piles. At high tide, they'll be hidden below the surface and on landing will pierce the Allies' boats. To avoid them, the enemy will have to disembark at low tide. Then they'll be in gun sight for a long time with no cover. He sows millions of mines on the shore and in the sea. He's going to flood all the lowlands from Holland to the Cantantin Peninsula. What Rommel doesn't know is that the French resistance has procured the complete plans of the Atlantic Wall and has succeeded in getting them to London. The Allies know the position of each pillbox, the caliber of every gun, the strength of each infantry unit. At the Casablanca conference, Roosevelt and Churchill have agreed to continue the war until the unconditional surrender of Germany. Churchill wants to attack in the south through the Balkans with the political motive of reaching Berlin before the Russians. But at the Tehran conference, Roosevelt and Stalin insist that the landing should be from the west. The second front that Stalin had wanted for the last two years will start on the Atlantic coast somewhere in France. General Marshall, Chief of General Staff, is the leading planner of the American Army. He wants to command the operation on the Western Front himself. But Roosevelt, considering the war in the Pacific and Japan as well, is against it. Marshall offers Roosevelt one of his personal staff, Eisenhower. On Christmas Day, 1943, Eisenhower becomes Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe. In effect, the stage is being set for the beginning of the great and crucial test all over the world. I have complete confidence that the soldiers, sailors, and airmen, and all the civil populations of the United Nations will demonstrate once and for all that an aroused democracy is the most formidable fighting machine that can be devised. Eisenhower has installed his general staff at Southwick House on the English coast. Four are English and three American. February 1944. The Air Force has already begun to prepare the ground. The French pilots of the Group Lorraine take part in these tactical bombing missions. In four months, 6,000 planes make 22,000 sorties and drop 76,000 tons of bombs on occupied France. Between the Seine and the Loire, all crossroads, railway stations and bridges are being systematically destroyed. This will prove fatal to the movement of German armor in the battles to come. May 1944. All units are camped in the south of England and the assembly points are out of bounds to civilians and severely controlled. The hour approaches. Rations are distributed and occupation money in France. 
So the landing is going to be somewhere in France. But where? The soldiers will now depend on their training and their weapons to see them through. Boats will have to be as sharp as possible to defeat the experienced German soldiers waiting on the other side of the water. There's plenty of time to write long letters to parents in Sussex or Oklahoma. The last, perhaps. Censorship. For several days, even ambassadors are unable to communicate with their governments. England is cut off from the world. At last, the landing plans are studied on the meticulously accurate scale models. Every single tree is there, but the place names are fictitious. Is it Brittany, Normandy, or Pas de Calais? General George Patton, christened Old Blood and Guts by the GIs in Italy, has positioned his troops just outside Dover, opposite Pas de Calais. But this turns out to be just another manoeuvre to deceive the enemy. It completely misleads the Germans. It is exactly here, in the Pas de Calais, that they are waiting for the Allied attack. This is the most fortified spot on the Atlantic coast. Rommel, nervous and tired, decides to leave for Germany. It's his wife's birthday. He's also arranged a meeting with Hitler to ask for more reinforcements. The weather report is bad. So it sets off the following morning at dawn, after reassuring his troops. Meanwhile, in the English ports, the troops have embarked. Loaded like pack horses, they've been issued with all equipment in triplicate. Soldiers crowd together in the holds of the ships and wait. But one day, two days, three days. Why? The sun is still shining brightly. The most difficult thing to bear is inaction. Fighting men who fret gradually lose the fine edge of morale that has taken so long to prepare. Card games are no substitute for the release of tension. Everything depends on the weather, in fact and also on the tide and the moonlight. In spite of appearances, the weather forecast is bad. They want to land on June the 5th, but have to turn back. The storm is too fierce in the channel. The 6th of June is still all right. The 7th is also possible, but the 8th will be too late. Eisenhower sees the effect this waiting is having on the army's morale, but what can he do? He hasn't arranged this blasted weather. On Sunday at nine o'clock in the evening, the chief meteorological officer, Group Captain J.M. Stagg, forecasts a clearing for Tuesday the 6th. Everyone turns to Ike. I thought it was just the best of the a bad bargain, so I possibly sat silently just reviewing these things, maybe, oh, I'd say 35 or 45 seconds. Now it's been reported by some of the people present, for example, my own chief staff says that five minutes. Well, I know that one, but five minutes under such conditions sounds like a year. Actually, I think after 30, 45 seconds, something like that, I just got up and said, okay, we'll go, and uh, ever, <laughs> this room was emptied in two seconds. Along 20 miles of front, the most formidable armada of all time sails towards France making the journey in reverse of William the Conqueror nine centuries earlier. 5,000 ships protected by 700 naval vessels watched over by 13,000 planes and carrying 140,000 troops.
out in the channel, the storm hasn't died down yet. The weathermen have been mistaken about that. last, battle orders can be opened. No, it's not Pas de Calais, it's Normandy. Meanwhile, on the English airfields, 20,000 paratroopers prepare for the big jump. Two American divisions, the 101st under General Maxwell Taylor, and the 82nd under General Ridgway and General Gavin, and one British division under General Gale. Eisenhower has a heavy responsibility. It's been predicted that he could lose 80% of these men. They've never seen action and believe, for a few hours only, that they're going to play cowboys and Indians, that the whole thing is a big game. The pilots have stage fright even worse than the paratroopers. Between them, there are only a few dozen flying hours. They've been told, all you have to do is follow the plane in front of you. Don't worry about anything else. On the Cantantin Peninsula, the wind has blown them off their route. The pilots look for their drop zone and the flares. Go, 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 shout the sergeants. And everyone jumps a little wildly, scattered over 24 miles. Every man falls where he can. In a tree, in a garden, in the marshes, where he drowns. By morning, a regiment of the 82nd has succeeded in regrouping and taking its objective, Santa Mary Glees. A third of the paratroopers have fallen in the little village square, right in the middle of the Germans. The objective is the region between the Veer Valley and the Valley of the Orme. Security has been secured by two paratroop drops, one around Saint Mary Glees to American divisions, and the other to the west of Khan, a British parachute division. Since dawn, the planes and battleships have been pounding the beaches. itself will take place on five code-named beaches. Sword, in front of Oystrom, a British beach. Juno, in front of Corsair, a Canadian beach. Gold, in front of Aramanche, another British beach. And two American beaches, Omaha and Utah. The first near Verville, and the second in front of Santa Marie du Mont. Altogether, nine Allied divisions with about 200,000 men. Opposite them, nine German divisions at about the same strength. The Allies hadn't therefore got superiority on the ground. Nevertheless, on Utah Beach, everything is going well. The first assault wave is commanded by General Teddy Roosevelt, 57 years old, cousin of the President. The Air Force has leveled the Atlantic War. The German land troops, stunned by the bombardment, surrender without a real fight. And the Americans advance immediately inland to rendezvous with the paratroops at Santa Mare Eglise. Normans can hardly believe their eyes, while the children stare open-mouthed at these soldiers from the skies. For the moment, it's a military walk-in. So where are the Germans? 
They're there, crouching in ambush. A battalion of the 6th Regiment under Colonel von der Heidt. Specially trained for anti-air landing operations, waiting for the Americans on the road to Kalantan. The German soldiers are well trained and still confident of defeating the untried Allied soldiers who are thrown ashore in what appears to be a desperate gamble. There are a few commanding officers, however, who understand more of the task facing them. Colonel von der Heidt, who commands the anti-parachute operations around Carantin, had installed his command post in the village of Santa Marie du Mont. When he climbed into the church tower to look out towards the coast, he saw a sight that was enough to dishearten the bravest soldier. The Allied invasion fleet lay offshore. His soldiers hidden in the bushes, waiting for the first wave of American troops, were wise to skulk and hide in ambush. The tide of military power coming in was awesome. The first American prisoners confirm it. Yes, it really is the landing. But they seem to be thinking to themselves, wait and see what's in store for you. On the Omaha beach, all hell is let loose. The Allied Air Force has missed its target. The German defences are intact. The first assault wave is stuck in the mud, but the others are already following. The second, third, and fourth. The tide rises. Thousands of men are crowded together between the sea and the cliff. The amphibian tanks have been put into the sea too soon. They are foundering, one after the other. General Cotter pulls himself up and drags along a handful of men to mount an assault on the blockhouse. The Omaha landing succeeds, but at a terrible price. 2,000 dead, wounded, or missing. At Hawk Point, the 225 Rangers of Colonel Ruder scale the cliffs with grappling irons and rope ladders. Mission to neutralize a long range battery. When they take possession of it, Colonel Ruder has lost half his men, and he sees that the guns aren't there. They've been moved inland. For 48 hours, the resistance had been trying to inform London. On the English coast, all night and all morning, gliders drop 6,000 paratroops onto the banks of the Orne, somehow or other, more by luck than judgment. of the British paratroops is to secure the bridge of Benoville on the Orne. On the British beaches, codenamed Gold and Sword, the Tommies remind themselves of Lord Astley's prayer before the battle. My God, in a few moments I'm going to be very busy. I shall surely forget you, but don't you forget me. The 1st Commander Brigade lands in front of Oostrum. Colonel Dawson, Chief of General Staff, orders the two landing craft carrying General Kiefer's commandos to go in.
advice of heavy losses, Kiefer's commando take the blockhouse the Germans had built in the square of the Casino de Riva Bella. Now they can carry on towards the bridge at Benneville, where the paratroops are waiting. At the head of the commandos is the youngest general in the British Army, already a veteran of Narvik and Dieppe. Thirty years old, a Scottish peer, General Lord Lovett. With Lord Lovett was Bill Millen, his personal pilot. Thirty years later, Bill Millen returns to the bridge of Benneville to play blue bonnets over the border, as he had in 1944, when he marched alone over the bridge to pike his defiance. in the afternoon, ten hours after the landing, Rommel's only armoured division, the 21st Panzers, launch a counter-attack. The Germans discover in their turn the attractions of the Allied equipment, the jeep, which they enthusiastically adopt. At the end of the day, the 21st Panzers reach the beach at Lucienet, the only Germans ever to do so. Rommel was right. It was here that the battle should have been fought. It was too late now. The Germans fall back to their previous position. Rommel returns from Germany the same evening, June the 6th. He inspects the front and interrogates General Meindel's paratroops himself. Then he goes to Saint-Germain to see old Marshal von Rundstedt, Commander-in-Chief in the West. Rommel is furious. He wants armoured troops, armour at any price. He must shorten the front and counterattack quickly. But Hitler obstinately keeps the Panzer SS in reserve. The Fuhrer will listen to nothing. He has no confidence in anyone. What if this landing is a trick, he said. To all appearances, he lives in a dream. A dream of secret weapons. The V-1, the flying bombs with which he has decided to destroy London. In 15 days, 2,000 V-1s are launched on England, causing considerable havoc. But the British have experienced similar horrors before. It takes more than the buzz bombs to change the course of the war. At last, Hitler believes the invasion. From all corners of Europe, from Russia, from Germany, and above all from France, German reinforcements make for Normandy. Il fait chaud à Suez, il fait chaud à Suez, repeats the BBC. That's the signal. The French resistance joins in the battle. over France, 30,000 Machizard, armed only with Tommy guns and explosives, harass the German convoys, slowing down their progress towards the front. It's called Operation Tortoise. Their action, said Eisenhower, saved us five divisions. is swift and savage, and the Germans find Frenchmen Danans militia to help them kill and torture other Frenchmen. The 
the SS division does Reich, which is coming up from Toulouse, is held back by four days. Exasperated, the SS leave terror in their wake. At Oradour sur Glane, they shut all the people in the church and set it alight. At Toul, they hang hostages from the balconies. The nearer they approach the battlefield, the more their pace slows down. Goebbels' propaganda tries to build up the morale of the troops and insists, Eisenhower hasn't surprised us. Propaganda is of little comfort to the German soldier and he undergoes all the shattering effects of the American fighter-bomber attacks. The German fighters are nowhere to be seen and the Allied planes can carry out their strikes unopposed. The Luftwaffe has been pushed right back into Germany by the Allied fighter sweeps and the shortage of fuel and pilots has eliminated the once feared German air power. On the evening of June the 6th, the Allies haven't attained all their objectives. In the west, the link has been made between Utah Beach and the parachutes. Vierville, Omaha Beach, is closely surrounded by the Germans, and the British forces themselves are divided by the German counter-attack at Lusumere. Above all, Kahn, the principal objective of D-Day, is still in German hands. The Americans go up the Contentin Peninsula, following a road marked by ruined villages. For the Normans, liberation has two faces, war and friendship. In advance of their other countrymen, they learn several American words, GI, Jeep, OK. After the hard battles for Vologne and Mondebourg, the Americans approach Cherbourg. The Germans have entrenched themselves there. Hitler has cabled, even if the worst comes to the worst, Cherbourg must be defended to the last man. All Germany is watching. For a whole week, the town has had to be cleaned up house by house. has fallen, but General von Schlieben and Admiral Reinecke have locked themselves in the fortress with the rest of the garrison. soldiers surrender. This is your last chance. The loudspeakers of the psychological warfare unit join the bombardment. Before surrendering, the Germans blow up all the port installations. By June the 30th, it's over. With 800 survivors, General von Schlieben surrenders to General Cotton. Hitler has a fit of hysterics and publicly calls Schlieben a coward.
Cherbourg is taken. Cherbourg, of which nothing remains. In 19 days, record time, American engineering know-how, helped by French weapon, put the port in working order. In two weeks, the Allies have already built two artificial ports, the Mulberry Harbors. Now the point of those enormous structures, made in secret in England, which followed the landing fleet across the channel, becomes obvious. Dozens of boats have been brought over to form breakwaters. Old merchant ships are filled with cement and sunk. They are 200 feet long and weigh 6,000 tons. Finally, 11 miles of jetties are constructed with hundreds of floating pontoons. The English dock has been constructed at Aramanche and christened Winston in honour of Churchill, who had the idea of trying this giant Meccano set. The second, the American port, has been installed in front of Saint Laurent. On June the 19th, a storm blew up, the most violent that had ever been experienced for that time of year. Eventually, the American dock had to be abandoned, but the British Winston held. In two months, two million men and 500,000 vehicles had disembarked at Aramont. The extent of the Allies' preparations continues to stagger the Germans. One week after the landing, the Americans have constructed 45 landing strips in metallic mesh. They are erected in a few hours. From now on, fighter cover is immediately available. Lost on a deserted beach in the south of England, this strange ice cream parlor is really a secret pumping station. To keep the expeditionary force supplied with fuel, Churchill has the idea for a pipeline, codenamed Pluto, whose enormous reels unroll and lie along the bottom of the channel. This pipeline will follow the Allied divisions right into Germany. For four years, Churchill has waited for this moment. For four years, he'd said to Parliament, you ask me what is my goal, I reply to you with one word, victory. Now he had it. He wanted to land with the British troops himself. But when the king heard the news, he decreed, very well, if my prime minister is going there, I shall go too. It was the only way of preventing the old British lion from going to war at 70 years of age. King George VI, congratulates Montgomery in his turn. For Eisenhower, the diplomatist general, there is now a grave political problem, that of free France. Roosevelt refuses to recognize the provisional government of General de Gaulle and wants to install an American military administration in France, AMGOT, until the end of the war. Churchill is in a difficult position because he has always supported the free French and realizes their importance to the Allied cause. De Gaulle has been keeping to himself in Algiers, away from the Allied planners, resentful of Roosevelt's hostility to his viewpoint and achievements in rallying the French nation. He cannot admit that the Americans would control occupied France in his place. It's a political crisis of the worst sort. If De Gaulle does not cooperate and the Americans do not accept his leadership, the Allied invasion will face unknown complications. In the end, de Gaulle makes his point. Eisenhower holds a long conference with him on the eve of the Normandy landings. The two men understand each other. When he sets foot on the Corsair beach on June the 14th, 
This gesture has a symbolic value too, political as well as military. For him, the only legitimate France is that which, like himself, refuses to accept defeat. Montgomery, who marks time in front of Caen for three weeks, decides on June the 26th to launch a big offensive, Operation Epsom. But the weather is overcast and the Allied planes are unable to take off to support the advance of the Sherman tanks. Five armoured SS divisions are waiting for the British attack. They are equipped with Tiger 48-ton tanks, armed with the famous 88-gun. Tigers savage the Allied tanks. One single crew destroys 16 Shermans in one hour. Operation Epsom is halted in its tracks. The young recruits, turned into fanatics by Hitler, can still laugh. But the weather is clearing. Allied planes are airborne. They attack the aerodrome of Kapike in the suburbs of Khan, which is held by the 12th SS Panzer Division. Rocket-firing typhoons pulverize the German position. Montgomery wants to make an end and decides to wipe out the German defences. On July the 7th, he loses 467 heavy bombers on Kahn before attacking the town from the front. On July the 8th, a month after the landing, Canadian tanks rumble into the town. After ten days of fighting in the streets, the British achieve the capture of Khan. Montgomery, criticised from London for the slowness of his advance, wants to push on at once on the road to Paris. He inaugurates Operation Goodwood of July the 18th with a formidable bombardment of the steelworks of Colombelle to the north of the Orne, where the Germans are entrenched. The Cromwell tanks set themselves in motion at 5.30 in the morning on July the 18th. The Tigers, having been knocked out by the bombardment, the British divisions follow the railway line from Cagny and advance freely onto the plain. Unexpectedly, they're shattered by the anti-aircraft batteries of the German 88mm cannons. The Germans use new anti-tank weapons like the guided Goliath and the rocket launchers, imitations of Stalin's weapons.
than a hundred British tanks are destroyed. Operation Goodwood is halted. In the West, General Bradley's Americans, whose objective is Saint Lo, are also held up. It's impossible to press forward in this maze of hedgerows where there are snipers and paratroops and SS units of the German 7th Army. Only the little Piper Cubs, the eyes of the artillery, can help to clean up the area, one hedgerow after another. Even the tanks are caught up in the tent. Twelve divisions take 17 days to advance six miles. An American handyman, Sergeant Cullen, then invents a new monster, the rhinoceros. Using Rommel's iron stakes from the beach defences, he prepares spurs which are welded to the front of the tanks. Thanks to him, the armoured troops break free of the thickets and go forward again. On July the 18th, the Americans at last seize Saint Lo. The first jeep to enter the town carries a coffin on its foot, draped with the stars and stripes. It's the body of Major Howie. He had sworn to be the first to enter Saint Lo. His men have respected his wish. General Hodge's tanks have broken through. Patton's army sweeps across the breach and the advance of the armies through the liberated towns begins to take on an air of triumph. Meanwhile, Hitler Proudly holding out his bandaged hand is smiling. Why the bandage? On July the 20th, he miraculously escaped from an assassination attempt. In the command post at Rustenburg, Colonel von Stauffenberg, chief of the plotters, had put a bomb under the heavy conference table. Its very thickness saved the Fuhrer's life. Hitler's faithful supporters congratulate him. It's truly a miracle. God is with me, the Fuhrer declares on the radio. On July the 17th, Rommel, seriously wounded by Allied planes, is replaced by Marshal von Kluger. For the Germans, the situation is becoming very dangerous. They have no defence to offer against Patton's army, which spreads through Britain. On the other flank, Montgomery tries to reach Falaise from Caen. An encirclement seems to be the Allied plan. Five Panzer divisions travel all night to avoid air attacks and hope to surprise the American forces. But at daybreak, they are spotted by ten squadrons of British Typhoon fighters armed with rockets. The result is catastrophic for the German high command. One hundred and sixty-three German tanks are destroyed. The Panzer SS are crippled. For the first time in military history, a powerful ground offensive has been stopped by planes alone. On the Normandy beaches, Allied reinforcements continue to flow in. On the 1st of August, the French 2nd Armoured Division lands at Utah Beach. Three years after General Leclerc, leaving Africa, had sworn not to lay down arms until the French flag is flying over Paris and Strasbourg. 16,000 men, 
410 tanks and 650 French guns joined the American armies in a vast turning movement towards the south. By a stroke of genius, General Bradley has the idea of encircling the remains of the three German armies, which are retreating towards the Seine. The British close the pincers in the north. On August the 14th, covered by 1,000 bombers and 720 guns, 900 tanks launch an armoured attack in the direction of Palais. On the morning of the 16th, the Canadians take Falaise and the castle of William the Conqueror. Montgomery telephones Bradley, we will meet at Chambois. And on August the 19th, the Allies make their rendezvous in this little village on the Dee. Ten German divisions are caught in the trap. On Mount Ormel, General Maziek's pole guard the entry to the Falaise pocket. Montgomery has told them, you are the cork in the bottle. Hold it well. The pole stood firm and sealed the fate of the trapped German forces. It was a second starting draft. Two days, two German armies dissolved in the cauldron of the Falaise. In two days, Hitler lost his best regiments, the crack paratroops and the redoubtable SS Panzer divisions. He had hesitated too long before throwing them into battle. Two hundred thousand dead, wounded, or taken prisoner. The Battle of Normandy had lasted two months and fifteen days. It was the end of the road for the Germans in the West.